Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based here in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. You can find me at joshuaritter.com. We are recording this on Friday, January 6th, 2023. And so happy new year, everyone. This is our first podcast of 2023. And we are excited to announce that we have reached 5 million subscribers on YouTube. And that's all because of you guys listening and watching. And so we're so very grateful. And it's a great way to start the new year. Uh, In this week's episode, we have some really exciting cases. First, the conviction of hip hop artist Tory Lanez following the assault um, that left artist Megan the Stallion with bullet fragments in her feet, as well as the sentencing of Rick Singer, the perpetrator of the infamous college admissions scandal that helped children of high profile and wealthy clients gain admission to some of the nation's most prestigious universities. And finally, the retrial of a former stockbroker whose murder conviction was overturned after the use of a controversial piece of evidence left behind by his deceased wife. Today, we are joined by Jack Rice, a criminal defense lawyer and legal commentator. You may have seen him on Court TV, MSNBC, Fox, and many other outlets. Jack, welcome back. Good to see you again. Well, thank you, my friend. I'm always happy to do it. You know that. I do, and I appreciate that. That's exactly. We'd be doing this anyways. (laughs) Totally Uh, true. For those uh, listeners and and those watching who have not seen you on the show before, can you please uh, tell us a little bit about your background and your current practice? Sure. I'm a criminal defense attorney and and I'm a trial lawyer based out of St. Paul, Minnesota. I've been doing this for decades, frankly. I know just like you. And uh, primarily, I do a lot of serious assault cases, rape cases, murder cases. And so I've tried a lot of cases. I'm a board certified criminal law specialist. I'm a former prosecutor. Uh, years back, I'm a former Central Intelligence Agency case officer. I bring a lot of different things to the table sometimes. So this is a lot of fun. I'm always happy to do it. No, and, it, and it's because of all that experience that we're really excited to hear your thoughts on these cases, uh, especially the last one it is kind of uh, interesting from a very legal perspective. So I, I, I'll when we get to that, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. But first, let's uh, let's jump right into Los Angeles, California, following a contentious trial. A Los Angeles jury convicted Canadian hip hop artist Tory Lanez on three felonies following his shooting of fellow artist Megan the Stallion. The incident, which dates to 2020, was the result of an argument between Megan and Lanez that took place in the Hollywood Hills following a celebrity party. According to Megan's testimony, the argument became especially heated when she insulted Lanez's music. Megan alleges that she walked away from the SUV that they were riding in. Lanes yelled for Megan to dance before firing a handgun at her feet. She later needed surgery to remove those bullet fragments. The defense argued that Lanes was not the shooter, alleging that a mutual friend who was with the pair fired the shots at Megan in a jealous rage. However, the jury of seven women and five men deliberated for only a day before convicting Lanes of assault with a firearm, possession of an unregistered firearm, and discharging a firearm with gross negligence. Jurors also agreed that there were aggravating factors, which means he could be sentenced to up to 22 years in prison and uh, risk deportation. His sentencing is uh, set for January 25th of this year. Okay, Jack, jump right in. What was your reaction to this verdict? I know you had been following this case. Yeah, I I have. Uh, I was impressed with what the prosecution did, honestly. And the reason I was impressed by what they did was that anytime you're prosecuting or defending, it almost doesn't matter in this sense. You need to be able to to tell a cohesive story, but telling a story that a jury will viscerally accept. They will be able to hear this, feel this and say, you know what, that's just right. Or or that, that just doesn't make sense. In this particular case, this idea of what Megan did when she took the stand is she talked about what this was, how it felt, what it meant, this idea of dance. It just felt, it felt right. And when you get something like that, plus some forensic evidence, like some of, of the bullet fragments they pulled out of her, I mean, all of those things, they fit into that cohesive answer that a jury loves. And they loved it in this case with seven in five people. 
Yeah, yeah. It's storytelling, right? I mean, yep. if you cannot tell a good story, and I don't mean to use the word story like it's no. not true, but you have to even, you know, take a police report, make it come to life. Take someone's testimony and make it, like you said, visceral and real. It's storytelling at its very purest form, and it has to be convincing storytelling. And I agree with you. I think the prosecution did a marvelous job in this case. Let's talk a little bit about the defense because they made an interesting choice here. They didn't go with, the, they opted for the defense of, I didn't do it. Not, this was an accident, not the gun misfired, not um, I never intended to harm her, or and not even self-defense, but I didn't do it, somebody else did it. Do you think that was a mistake or was that all they were left with? Well, you know, uh, and I know you've seen this too. There are times when we get backed into the corner and yeah. you're stuck with what you're stuck with. And you you would think to yourself, I got to have something better than this. But sometimes you don't. And so you're stuck with what you're stuck with. And part of the problem is this, is that what can sometimes happen is there are no offers on the table. You'll have a prosecutor who comes to you and their response is plead guilty straight up or plead to count one, the worst of the bunch, with no agreement. And so what you don't get is something called, at least what we call up here in the, in the upper Midwest, a cap. You don't get a cap on time, so you can't right. limit the parameters of exposure. And so you're stuck. But in this particular case, when you actually say, I didn't do it, the problem is, is you have at least one person, two actually, who will say, oh yeah, he did it. Whereas what you could do is if you had gone with a different theory, and we could have talked about that, Josh, if we wanted to at the beginning of this, this idea of telling a cohesive st story. It's about theory, but it's about theme. But if you go with a different theory of your case, you could accept both of what they say, which is he did it. At right. least then you can say, you're right, I did it. And I can't believe it happened this way. I right. never thought this was gonna play out because you sometimes have to embrace the facts that are provided to you, embrace even the testimony that is going to be pushed against you because then what you can do is you can say, they don't know what was in your head. They just know that you pulled the trigger. Fine, I pulled the trigger. Here's why or how yeah. or what happened. It gives you something else, something more. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't wanna be one of those having a conversation where we're kind of second guessing another attorney. I'm not trying to do that, but just if we could look at it, if this just got handed to us here, I agree with you. I, I, I think that the best defenses are the ones that admit as much as what they can, right? And so here, I think you have to admit the gun was in his hand. I think the, the theory of I wasn't even holding the gun, somebody else fired it, it's not gonna go anywhere. It's not gonna get traction. And to your point, it's not gonna create a visceral story that the, the jury can hang their hat on. But I think the alternative of, you're right, I had the gun, I admit that. You're right, the gun was in my hand when it was fired, I admit that. But to your point, you don't know what I was thinking. What I, what I was thinking is I was as much shocked that it went off as anybody else. I certainly you, did not mean to shoot it. And, you, and, and this is all you know, an accident, you know, and, and throw yourself at the mercy of the jury. Well, you know, you could do that. I mean, maybe one of the reasons, and again, I mean, I, I am not second guessing this, this defense attorney either in that sense, because sometimes you're stuck. Here's right. an example of that. Let's say you make that, that argument. Now what you've just done is you pled guilty to count two. You pled guilty right. to possession without re a registration of a firearm. Yeah. And just all of a sudden, you got a felony count sitting in your hands right now before you're out of the chute. And that's 100%. a real, dare I use that term, um, but you're, before you can even start. And so depending upon priors, depending upon other circumstances, the problem that you get is that you may be shackled to certain stories because if you open up one side, you just didn't think you're going to go down on everything. And that 100%. can happen. And, and, and he's facing deportation. That could have been yes, that could is. have been it. That could have been mm -hmm. I can't take anything because I got to be able to work in this country. And, and that could that have been the reason why they yeah, decided to shoot the, the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. No, you're right. All the time. You're right. Yeah. We, we just do. Talk to me about your thoughts on sentencing, because his exposure is 22 years. You think, what do, what do you think? I mean, you know, I, I'm asking you to read the tea leaves here, but do you think yeah. a judge is really going to give him serious time on this? No, I don't. Uh, the injuries weren't as substantial as one would think. And in some cases, this was closer to a second degree assault. This is a relatively simple case in some ways. Uh, and and normally I could see somebody going down for two to four, two to six. 
I, I don't think somebody would cross the 10 year mark. The problem is, is, you know, this idea of, and this is something people sometimes don't think about, this idea of we all have a presumption of innocence. The state has to prove is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We have the right to go to trial. Guess what? There can sometimes be a cost to going to trial. You sometimes go to trial, and if you lose, you have a judge who's a human being will sometimes look at this case and say, because of what you did, your decision to exercise your constitutional right, they won't say this, but I think they think it. And I, I don't know if you agree or not, but they think that because you decided to go to trial and waste my time, waste this jury's time, waste all of that court or resources, you're going to pay a price for that. So you could see a judge kind of go, you know, you did it exactly the same, but if you had pled, I'll give you this. But because you didn't, I'm going to give you this. Yeah. Well, the way they the way they describe it is they say um, you can take advantage of an early disposition of this case. The, the 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 flip side that is unsaid is if you don't take advantage, just wait and see. <laughs> yeah, well, you um, know, they can also argue this. They can say a lack of remorse. Right. And that's, right. The, you know, if you say, I'm sorry, I did it. I screwed up. I can't believe this happened. Well, now you get something potentially for that. If you go to trial, it's kind of hard after the fact and say, got me. No. Yeah, I think that this does end up with him in some some custody time. I agree with you. It's probably yeah. in the single single digits. But um, but I can't see a judge really hammering him for for the conduct. Even even everything is assumed to be true that was in the police reports. It still does not rise to that level where you would see somebody doing you know a decade or more in prison. But yeah. we shall they see. Might even we, have been they might even have been ricochet rounds because we had fragments. Whereas right. whereas I so which makes me think which by the way was some of the evidence right this idea yeah. of consistency of dance it's the idea yeah. you shoot at the ground and it bounces off into somebody at least then they might see an argument that yeah this was a stupid idea that i saw in the movies but for some and reason it, i it, thought i didn't think it was going to hit her yeah no no one ends up with with bullet fragments in their feet when it happens in the movies <laughs> right right well, we'll keep an eye on this case and see how the sentence does turn out for Mr. Lanes. Let's turn now to Boston, uh, Massachusetts, where nearly four years after the, the story first broke, Rick Singer, former owner of the college counseling and prep enterprise known as The Key, has finally been sentenced to three and a half years in federal prison for his orchestration of the college admission scandal referred to as Operation Varsity Blues. He will also have to pay nearly $20 million in restitution and forfeitures of ill-gotten gains. Singer's prep business helped parents of wealthy students gain admission to prestigious universities in some cases by coordinating cheating on standardized tests like the SAT or ACT. In other instances, bribes to administrators and college coaches were also facilitated, uh, allowing for designation as student athletes, even if students didn't play that sport. The sprawling scandal resulted in the arrest of over 50 people, including actresses, CEOs, test administrators, and coaches. While Springer pled guilty to charges of conspiracy, racketeering, money laundering, and obstruction of justice in March of 2019, his sentence represents the most severe given to any participant in the scandal. Prosecutors allege that Singer gained more than $25 million from clients, paying more than $7 million in bribes, and profiting over $15 million for himself. So they've described this as, and it is, the most time that anyone has been sentenced to in relation to this conspiracy. But Jack, in your opinion, is it too little? Is it too much? Just right? What do you think? Josh, I'm torn on this case. I mean, I really am. And, and maybe maybe I'm biased, okay? Mm -hmm. So here's why. I, I got four kids. My youngest right now is a senior in high school. And, oh, you're and they're in, getting you're in the thick of it. Oh, brother, you have no idea. It's a nightmare. <laughs> and, and, and the fourth is getting ready to go to college. And we're dealing with all of these scholarships and applications and all of these companies coming to us saying things like, we can help you with your testing. We can tell you with scholarships. We, can we know people in schools. I mean, the problem that I have with it is that I hate the, the, the unfairness of it all. Yeah. I hate the unfairness of it all. And and yet at, at the same time, so which makes me want to go after him. And yet at the same time, I know absolutely there are people who are connected, who know the boards of regents at Yale yep. and Harvard and SC and UCLA and, and wherever else. And it's just fine 
if yeah. I know these people and I can pull triggers or here's what, how about this? I can, I can build you a library in your school. Yeah. My kid's kind of a knuckle dragger, but I can build you a library. Right. You know? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so hundred oh, percent. See, that's the part that gets to me. I mean, yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, it, this was another question I was going to ask you, but l let's jump into it because he has infamously described this scheme as the side door, right? He said that there, there, there's the front door, which means you get in on your own. There's the back door through institutional advancement, which is 10 times as much money. And I've created this side door. And he's talking exactly what you're talking about. This has been going on for forever. You, you, you just have to you just have to pay 10 times as much as what Singer was asking you to pay. And the way that he would describe it to a lot of these parents is, hey, I'm just making sure that the funds are getting to the proper people quickly. Um, and a lot of these parents were not charged because they didn't feel they were doing anything wrong. And it didn't appear that they were doing anything wrong if you if you appreciate their perspective on it. But I agree with you. It's it begs the larger question of how do we eliminate this altogether or, or can we? As long as there's wealthy parents and people desperate to get into these institutions, is it just going to be part of life? Well, I, the, the, the thing is, is again, I'm, I'm again, father four, youngest ones right on the cusp. The thing is, is how much have I how much effort have I gone to? I mean, I, I don't know how many applications we've filled out together. How many times I said, Dad, I need 80 bucks. Dad, I need $250. <laughs> Dad, I need, and I'm like, here, babe, just take it, take it. Just right. here's my card. Just, just, just keep it. It's yours. You just use it until it gets declined. And, and, and then we haven't even paid tuition yet. And my, right. and the idea is if I can get my kid into SC, if I can get my kid into UCLA, how much is that worth to my kids life? Right. Now you start asking that question and it isn't how much I'm going to pay now. How much is it worth to them in their life trajectory? And you have somebody who has the money. Is it shocking that what they're going to do is start pulling triggers and saying, you know what? I have somebody who was like the, 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 the head coach of the, of the football team. You think I'm not going to call them and say, what do I do next? Versus, I mean, by the way, that all being said, let me be clear in this. I grew up in a trailer park. My parents never graduated from high school. My grandparents worked in the fields. My brother and I were the very first in our entire extended family to ever go to college, wow. let alone go to law school. And so the idea that I could pick up the phone and call anybody, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about when I was applying. And right. so I look at this and I'm like, yeah, is it fair? That's not fair either. So right. this one, I'm just like, yes, does it suck? Yes. What he did was he helped them cheat on their tests. My response to that would be, guess what? SATs, LSATs, uh, master's program tests, these are all, all of them, they have found out they are objectively biased towards certain people against people of color, against those who are from uh, outside of the country. It has nothing to do necessarily with intelligence. It's written right. by a certain group of people for a certain group of people. So if do, am I really outraged at this guy because he's playing the system that others are playing it differently? Right. <laughs> and right. I'm the guy who's getting screwed at the end of the day. Right. <laughs> because right. I don't have the money. I don't have the connections. I don't have the guy who's saying back door, side door, front door. I, I got none of that. So yeah. I'm torn. <laughs> yeah. Well, the one wrinkle, though, and I agree with everything you're saying. The one wrinkle, though, that I think made his conduct more offensive to me was his profiting off of it, right? It would be one thing if he was running this kind of scam oh, and wasn't gosh. really dipping his hand into it. He made $15 million that we know of off of this scam. And I've seen, especially in the federal system, people, you get into the seven figures in a fraud scheme, you're, you're, you're doing several years in prison, easy. And so I, to me, I was thinking, is 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 he being showed some favor here because there there was no clear victim in all of this or was it his cooperation that perhaps bought him a, a lot of time go okay, ahead okay well so so let's say i got a kid who can throw a football really really well and penn state uh or uh michigan uh or ucla says, well, heck, we'll give you a free education, but we're going to make $50 million off that arm of yours. 
and they do it all the time. Mm -hmm. So UCLA makes 50 million, gives this guy a hundred thousand dollar education, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about who's making money on this thing, I mean, I'm sorry. The no, problem you're right. there, there's your, there's your, there's your motivation again. So, you know, we can wrap ourselves in, uh, in the laurels around our heads and we can put the graduation cloaks around our shoulders. But at the same time, I'm, I'm, I just see it packaged slightly differently, but it sure feels the same way to me, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, some of the, the parents, uh, they probably would have paid him his vig anyways, right? If they knew that, Hey, I need you to give me uh, 500,000 bucks. I'm going to take half of that. I'm going to give the other half to this person who's going to get your kid in. I think a lot of these parents would have said, fine, just as long as he gets in. I can show you on my cell phone right now, emails I'm getting from companies who can help quote unquote, help me get scholarships. Right. They, it, you think they're doing it for nothing? Right. They're right. all coming to me saying, all I need is X number of dollars in order to do that. So my question is, is are they motivated by altruism? <laughs> are they motivated by the bottom line? I think I'm yeah. doing pretty good on this argument, Josh. Oh, you I are 100%. Asked, no, the, 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 the problem is that it it's a broken kind of thing that we've yes. got this, there's this, this desire that makes no sense and it, it, and a lot of it is just kind of the prestige of it or you, you, you know, you feel like you're giving your kids this leg up. Maybe you are, maybe, maybe not so much, but it's this idea of this, this desperate desire to get these kids into these very elite schools. Um, yeah, and, and it, it's and also it, hard. It's also hard to to quantify sometimes why it is that they get in. Yeah. Yes, I understand. My father was the de was the secretary of defense. Right. Uh, my father or my mother is a famous actress in Hollywood. Uh, I have a gold medal from uh the olympics i mean it happens all the time all of a sudden you see this person who was who was a gymnast who has a gold medal who's at harvard and my response right. are they all that utterly uh, uh brilliant right. and i'm talking about in intellectually brilliant right. or do you think we got a couple of knuckle draggers in the group yeah. i mean i'm sorry i just yeah. i got just but the, that's but what you see is Harvard is like ah, I, I want that gold medal please, yes. and you're like why? Well, what's that going to do to you for you intellectually? But they're looking for something too. Yeah, they want something too. Everybody yeah. wants something, Josh. I know. Finally, we turn to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where a new trial, and this is the one I, I really want your thoughts on here, Jack. A new trial has been scheduled for Mark Jensen, a former stockbroker convicted in 2008. OK, of poisoning his wife, Julie Jensen, with antifreeze nearly a decade earlier. It was alleged that Mark murdered his wife to continue his affair with his co-worker, who he later married following his wife's death. Mark's defense alleged that Julie's death was a suicide, arguing that she had a history of depression and her death was a reaction to her husband's infidelity. The case gained notoriety for a highly controversial piece of evidence used by the prosecution. Get this, a letter which was written by Julie expressing that she would not commit suicide and then in the event of her death, her husband should be considered a suspect. This led to Mark's conviction being overturned in 2013 with the court agreeing that the evidence violated his Sixth Amendment right. Now prosecutors will attempt to retry Mark for murder. However, statements made by Julie and the letter will not be used in trial. Mark Jensen's trial is scheduled for January 9th of this year. This was the case that I was really happy to talk to you about because I know you have such an interesting uh, take on these things and an understanding of this. But could you first explain for listeners ex exactly what was going on with this letter and why the court decided to throw it out? OK, it's complicated because it kind of yeah. goes up to the Court of Appeals. It comes back down there. They start looking at Supreme Court cases, too. So federal Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court cases that could impact what that means, what the Sixth Amendment means or yeah. how you look at something on appeal. So it gets complicated. But maybe if we, we pull back for a second and think about it this way, sometimes what can happen is if you had something called a dying declaration and what that means is. You know, the police come and there's a woman with with with, with a, a knife in her chest and she goes, it was Josh Ritter. That right. guy did it to me. That's probably going to come in. 
And the reason that's going to come in is because it's part of an investigation, an ongoing investigation. It, it, it uh, It's non-testimonial, if you will. At least that's the argument they're going to make, that it wasn't actually testimonial. And if you caused it, that's the argument. That may all be a piece of why that comes in differently. And so right. that's that's really part of this argument. This is not that. And, and right. explain too, just to, so everybody's following along, the reason it wouldn't come in is because it's hearsay. Because otherwise right. you're talking about a statement that's made out of court that you're trying to present and the person is not testifying to it right. in court, but this right. is an it's exception a, to that. Right, so that's true. Let's, so if we actually started with step one, I went to step right. two. The idea is if you have an out of court statement and you wanna say, let's get in that out of court statement, generally speaking, the rule is it doesn't come in, generally right. speaking. And so this is an exception to that rule that would say, oh, it was Josh, he did that to me. Right. That's the exception. And so what you're saying here is, uh, is the prosecutors were trying to bootstrap that concept right. with this letter by saying, this is the equivalent of the knife in the chest and the police show up. Well, the thing is, is that, and the judge agreed, by the way, that's why they let it in. And then they took it up to the Court of Appeals and what you saw then was a fight on whether or not it was sufficient or insufficient. And what they actually did is they argued it slightly differently. They started arguing that, that well, they had enough evidence despite that to win. And so right. therefore, no harm, no foul. That's the, for, for, rather than use the legalese, no harm, no foul. They still had enough on him. That was whatever. Even if we excluded that, that, that was error, but not a big deal. The right. problem is, is what this was, when you really look at it, is it's a very big deal because this is a unique piece of evidence that you can't, you can't confront. It wasn't non-testimonial. It is hearsay. And the problem is, is what it does is it points unilaterally at this man and he has no way of being able to respond to it. And he's stuck with this letter that says, my husband murdered me. There's yeah. no way you can fight that fight. And it was something that was premeditated on her part. She wrote this stuff down. It, it feels wrong for a lot of people because they're saying, if I die, you should be looking at this guy. That seems like it should have value. And yet at the same time, this idea and one of, one of the reasons we talk about hearsay and non-hearsay for those of us who aren't lawyers is that it's all about the ability for somebody who was charged with a crime to be able to confront the person who actually did and said and wrote something. If you can't, then what we can do is mail in all kinds of stuff from other people that says things, and we don't have the ability to confront them about what they did or did not say. And that's really a big part of what they were looking at in this case and why they decided we're going to go forward. We're going to retry this case after, what is it, 14 years now? By the way, he was sentenced to life. So 14 years, he's in custody. He always said from the beginning, I never did this thing. He didn't testify, but I didn't do this thing. This new trial will mean that the prosecutors to come back and try this case, but they don't get that piece of evidence. And that is a massive difference. And I think yeah. that in itself highlights why it is that that piece of evidence wasn't just no harm, no foul. It right. was a it was a, a monumental, the most important fundamental uh, anchor to what yeah. made the prosecution's case so powerful. Yeah, no, that was an excellent job of explaining all of that. Uh, thank you. Um, one one thing I wanted to kind of dovetail off of what you said is, I think too, uh, because even if it was a dying declaration that you've explained, somebody stabbed me, you show up, I've got the knife still on me, I said Jack did it, you know that that's jo going josh to be a lot did jo josh did it everybody's hey, gonna man. <laughs> don't point at me brother i don't know what you're talking about everybody's gonna allow that in and part of the reason you still can't cr uh, cross-examine that statement in court right you still mm -hmm. got all the same problems that you would have with the letter the difference being is that the the law has decided that there's something inherently reliable about that statement the, with that you with the knife in your chest are likely not going to be making up lies with the last few breaths that you have. Where this yes. letter is different is that she wasn't dying at the time she wrote this letter. She was 
suspicious that perhaps she was trying to do something to her, but that doesn't carry the same kind of inherent reliability for why we have carved out that exception. And that's the problem why I, I, I think the courts got it right. It should not have been a, a allowed, especially given the evidence. Now, I'm not saying I'm not trying to weigh in either way. Did he do it or not do it? But especially given the evidence that she have, may have been suffering from uh, her own kind of mental anguish at the time. Who, who knows how reliable she was even at the time she's writing that letter. So it, it is. And I agree with you. It's going to be a game changer in this case. They may still come back oh, yeah. with a conviction. But boy, is this a different case. Well, you know, I mean, they may or they may not. I mean, I yeah. agree with you. And again, that's the reason when we talk about hearsay, you know, this out of court statement that, that you there are exceptions to it. But all of those exceptions, every single one is designed to basically say we have a little more under this circumstance that gives us some confidence that this is true and reliable. And so therefore, we're going to allow it. Uh, uh, an example would be sometimes people will say an excited utterance. Yeah. Right. You say something like when you're in the heat of it, you know, it's like, oh, right. I hate that Josh Ritter guy. Yeah. And all of a sudden that comes in because it's more likely that it was just heat of the moment. It drops out of your mouth. It's more likely true. Uh, that's an example of, of maybe a little more confidence, just like it is if I'm dying and I'm on my last breath. And I, I have Josh's name, or I see I'll keep saying this over and over again, Josh, it, it is, <laughs> is just on my lips that somehow I, I, people, all people should be more confident that yeah. this is true than if it were just me planning, sitting back in the corner. Don't trust that Josh guy. He is a. Mm. Yeah, because in and, and, and you the points that you make is that we really are talking about a constitutional right. Uh, being at play here in the fact that we are allowing statements in that cannot be confronted and cross-examined, right? But in each of those exceptions and the ones that you point out, there's something that the courts have found that lends a reliability to it that outweighs whatever problems with confrontation. And so why they allow these types of statements in, which doesn't exist in this letter here. And so I, I'm, 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 really going to be following this case because just from a law school kind of question point of view i just think it's a fascinating example of you know as we're continuing to the the law continues to just kind of define things and we get these outlier cases and it adds to our understanding of of, of the right way to handle a trial well it also highlights something else in my mind is that sometimes and i remember i suspect you might have been this way i certainly was early on I, I I had this perception that judges were sacrosanct, that they were perfect, that they were right. geniuses, and they would sit up on these benches and talk from on high down to us lowly, and and that whatever they did was true and correct. It's not. Frequently. No. Frequently. <laughs> I find judges who don't know evidence. Yeah. They don't. They don't know the law. They don't know procedure. And they're a disaster. Yeah. Not all. I, I know some of the most brilliant jurists, judges who are incredible. But I, I have been in front of some who were less than credible. And in this particular case, <laughs> this judge made a. Yeah, how about that? I'm running for Congress next. Yeah, I'm you're being to be very kind. Speaker of the House. I'm working to be Speaker. Can I run next? And, you might. <laughs> be you and me. I know yeah, that anybody's got a chance time. at this point. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, in six months, people won't remember why that joke was funny. But, it was. <laughs> um, but, you know, this example where this judge made this monumental, catastrophic mistake, this man may have paid 14 years of his yeah. life because that judge saying, I'm just going to let it in. Yeah. Great. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, we will see. You could be right. We will see if this is actually the game changer in that case. Um, this was an absolute pleasure, Jack. Thank you so much for coming on this week. Where can people find out more about you? You can go to the website, jackricelaw.com. I mean, I I do a lot of stuff around the country and sometimes around the world, too. I'm getting ready to go and do some stuff in Prague in a couple of months. I was oh, wow. teaching in uh, in Istanbul not long ago. Before that, I was in Morocco. I was I've taught in Russia and the Republic of Georgia and Uganda, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, South Sudan. I mean, I, I teach trial advocacy stuff because I love this stuff. Josh, just yeah. like you, I just I can't help it. I just I, there's something about this that I just I just love. 
<laughs> uh, that's f very cool. I did not know that you go all around the world. I, I I'm going to stay right here uh, because I've got a, I've you got a two year old me, and, a, and a newborn on its way. So I'm probably not going anywhere for a while. But but next Haven't time you you're, you're enough, on a trip, a let break. me know. <laughs> Come with me, I man. do. Be great. I do. <laughs> um, well, thank you again. Um, and I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. Please check out my website at joshuaritter.com. And you can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar. <laughs>